If you're in the eastern U.S. and you're being bombarded by millions of raucous flying insects, we have some consolation for you. First, this is not the beginning of some biblical apocalypse. Second, this is the real world and you're not in some simulation of a science fiction movie. And third, those deafening winged arthropods are not those biblical locusts who bring devastation and chaos in their wake. Rather, they are the humble, rather dim-witted and absolutely enthralling cicada. Welcome to Intrigued Mind, and this atypical episode is on the beguiling wonders of the great eastern cicadas named Brood 10, which will be invading large parts of the Mid-Atlantic in May and June 2021. 17 years ago, in 2004, this exact phenomenon lust occurred to the alarm and disgust of millions of Americans. The invertebrate swarms invaded forests, campsites, resorts, cities, you name it, by the hundreds of billions, creating cacophonous dins which many liken to the sound of chainsaws or even low-flying jets. Then, after about four to six weeks, those cicadas that hadn't been devoured by critters in an orgiastic flying feast just dropped dead, in a manner almost as synchronized as their Blitzkrieg invasion thus ended their 17-year lives, in itself a formidable feat in the insect kingdom. Before the frenzied month-long climax of their lives, eastern cicadas, hereon called Brutin, spend the larger part of their lives underground. Starting as larvae burrowed about 8 feet under the soil, cicadas feed off liquid from the roots of plants, acquiring the nutrients to survive and after 17 years, escape the terrestrial womb. Extracting themselves from a lifelong pit filled with anal fluids, they burrow out of the soil right up to the surface. They then climb a nearby tree or plant to shed their skin, also called the exoskeleton, before taking off to meet their genetically determined fate. And you guessed it, in the time between their climactic departure and Mother Nature's sweeping holocaust, the cicadas of Brood 10 are in a desperate race against time to mate and create the next generation of cicadas. The racket you hear from them, which can reach decibels that cause hearing damage in humans, isn't random. They come out of the earth in what can only really be described as one colossal orgy, and the din you hear is the result of a male mating call. The sound is produced by the rapid vibration of ribbed membranes called timbals, located on either side of the abdomen, with the cicada's body acting as a resonance chamber and massively amplifying the sound. Male cicadas, which often even join together in groups so that their voices are heard from greater distances, telegraph their special C to females. And as it stands, to us humans, as well as to animals, jubilant at the easy dinner pickings. After the deed is done, female cicadas lay their eggs in plants and trees. Those eventually hatch, the larvae fall into the soil, and voila, the Darwinian epic continues on a loop. The female cicada typically lays an average of 400 eggs. This explains the sheer scale of the cicada invasion, with hundreds of billions, if not trillions of cicadas swarming the mid-Atlantic. Overbreeding is actually necessary for the survival of the species. Here's why. Cicadas have evolved to bear some fascinating traits. For example, they've developed antibiotic wings, which kill bacteria through microscopic spikes and a chemical coating, something which has caught the attention of scientists as a natural antibiotic to which harmful bacteria might not develop resistance. Another incredible trait is that male cicadas deafen themselves while serenading to protect themselves from their own racket. But one thing they haven't really evolved to do? Escaping predators. The expression, sitting ducks, should probably be revised in light of the kamikaze dim-wittedness of Brutin cicadas. Their orgiastic frenzy is a flying banquet for basically any critter higher up in the food chain that might have an appetite for them. Instead of developing defense mechanisms or any sense of predatorial danger, Brutin cicadas basically just breed like there's no tomorrow, almost literally. The animals that eat them are then so completely inundated with the flying buffet that they either can't possibly eat them all or just lose their appetite for them. The devoured cicadas are, therefore, victims of a rather unheroic yet essential sacrifice for their own brood, and of course, take some pressure off other prey. There's another evolutionary theory about the cicada's survival tactics. Brood 10 is one of 15 existing cicada broods that entomologists call periodical broods. These are cicadas which, like Brood 10, spawn and die at the same time, over periods of 13 or 17 years. Twelve periodical broods, including Brood 10, have 17-year lifespans while the remaining three have 13-year lifespans. The amazing fact that these lifespans both correspond to prime numbers has led entomologists to develop certain evolutionary theories about this rare instance in the insect world. The leading one goes that long life cycles, and especially those that are prime numbered, make it difficult for predators to sync up their own life cycles. This might explain why cicadas don't have one specialized predator, but then they still get eaten by opportunistic animals. There's also no explaining why the intervals aren't 11 or 19 years or any other prime number. The truth is, scientists are stumped. It's a complete mystery in the insect world. 
and something which warrants periodical cicadas, that extra bit of awe from entomologists. This is as opposed to what's called annual cicadas, which make up the great majority of the 3,400 or so cicada broods on planet Earth, and which, despite the name, actually live for four to five years. What we do know about the synchronized departure of billions of periodical cicadas is quite fascinating, and it's this. Periodical cicadas can measure the passing of time by counting the seasonal pulses of fluid in the plants off which they feed. In other words, every spring, whenever there's a slight increase in the nourishing fluids, the larva crosses off another year of their bug calendar. D-Day is 13 or 17 years after hatching, when soil temperatures reach approximately 65 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point they dig out of their burrows and take to the skies. For reasons like these, entomologists stress just how fascinating periodical cicadas really are. Most people feel a natural aversion to these flying black bugs, with their chunky two-inch bodies, thick wings, and blood-red eyes. In Homeric Greek literature, Eos, the goddess of dawn, asks Zeus to grant her lover, Tithonus, the gift of immortality. Zeus obliges, but since Eos never specified that she didn't want Tithonus to age, the young lover keeps on growing old until he is so shriveled, tiny and hideous, that he turns into the very first cicada. And generally speaking, Western history has not been so kind to cicadas. Though they've inspired copious literature, folklore, and art, countless times they've erroneously been conflated with locusts, the winged insects that actually are devastating to ecosystems and harvests, and have plagued human civilizations since time immemorial. One of the earliest recorded sightings of cicadas in the U.S., for instance, was in the spring of 1634, when pilgrims in Massachusetts were confronted with the phenomenon of millions of red-eyed bugs rising from the soil. The Puritans interpreted the brood as a pestilential swarm as found in the Old Testament, or millions of locusts of the kind that plagued Egypt after the Pharaoh refused Moses' plea to free the Jewish people. In the mid-1800s, many Americans believed cicadas to be omens of war. It wasn't just that they looked satanical, but their W-shaped wings were interpreted quite literally. In the early 20th century, the insects were the object of sensationalist headlines like these. Note the mistaken use of the term locust, and hundreds of thousands of Americans flocked outdoors, shovels in hand, to purge the bugs en masse. The conflation of locusts and cicadas survives to this day in the U.S. In Asiatic cultures, however, the distinction is not only clear, but cicadas are often generally well esteemed. In Chinese tradition, and for centuries, the cicada has been associated with rebirth and immortality, while for many Japanese people today, the song of the cicada is widely seen as the beginning of summer. Cicadas, and it should be stressed more, greatly benefit ecosystems. Not only are they an abundant food source for thousands of animal species, their corpses, enjoying a well-deserved and rather terminal break after their terrific mating frenzy, release valuable nutrients back into the soil. Though their invasion en masse can inflict some damage to trees, they often do more good by pruning some of the weaker branches. So, if the racket or red eyes put you off, just remember that they're harmless and some of the kinder flying insects and that they offer bountiful tasty treats to lots of animals that we do generally like. What's more, cicadas, particularly periodical broods, are an integral and unique part of American wildlife. They've been with us throughout the ages, emerging generation after generation. Thomas Jefferson studied them in the 1770s, writing his findings in his Horticultural Diary, which was later published. While delivering an imperialist speech in 1902, Teddy Roosevelt faced off with deafening hordes of cicadas that practically drowned him out, and Ronald Reagan likened his Democratic opponents to the flying bugs when he said this in a 1988 radio address. But most of all, feel free just to reflect on how incredible and complex the natural world really is. That cicadas, like the other beings that inhabit our little world, are also full of wonders and mysteries that for now escape our understanding. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.